Okay, well, well, welcome back for us to the regular scheduled city council meeting of July 27th. May we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Brooks here. Councilmember Clark here. Councilmember Peterson here. And Mayor Kirk, or Mayor Kaiser here. And Vice Mayor Brown is absent. Thank you. And would you all join in the pledge of allegiance? Great, thank you everybody. And uh, do we have any additions or deletions to the agenda? Staff has no changes to the agenda this evening. Great, and may we please have a report on closed session. The city council met and reviewed the items listed on the closed session agenda. Uh, they gave direction to staff and took no reportable action. Great, thank you. And additional materials this evening? Staff distributed additional materials relating to item 7F. There were updated attachments. Item 8C received two emails. Item 8E received three emails. Item 8F received three emails. All of the additional items for these four different council items were included in the agenda packet online and in the hard copy available at the back of the room and were sent to the city council in advance of the meeting. Great, thank you. Brings us to oral communications. Uh, this is time for members of the public to address the city council on any consent item on tonight's agenda or any topic within the jurisdiction that is not on our regular agenda. Do we have any members of the public that wish to speak? Seeing none in house, is there anybody online? There is nobody with their hand raised, Mayor. Thank you. Any uh, staff comments? I don't think we have any comments this evening. Okay. And any comments from council? I apologize. I was eyeballing our chief of police who might have an announcement. Come on down. And what I'll say as he works his way up, I'm really excited that I just saw a post of this event in English and Spanish for our community members. So thank you. Perfect. How's that? Um, I just want to um, talk about this coming Tuesday, August 1st, is going to be National Night Out at Jade Street Park. Um, we've got a lot of activities, kids act activities. We're going to bring some hot dogs and hamburgers and grill those up and great activities. So that is Jade Street Park this Tuesday, or this Tuesday, August 1st from 5 to 7, Jade Street Park. So thank you. That's it. Yeah, I'd like to volunteer and help you cook the hot dogs. We'll see you there. <laughs> be careful. Eyes. Real water. <laughs> Any other comments? Yeah, I'd like to uh, mention someone and an uh, organization out in the community, Random Acts of Capital of Kindness. Uh, this past week, they did a great job of taking care of the Depot Hill and Grand Avenue project that uh, needed something to be done about it, and they stepped up and took care of it with the help of uh, Public Works. So good job by all. Yeah, great collaboration. Thank you. Any other comments? All right, that takes us down to consent items. So all of these items listed under consent, they'll be enacted in one motion in the form listed below, unless any council member wishes to pull an item. Okay. Anyone move the consent? I would like to move to make a motion to approve the consent items. A second. Great, first and a second, may we have a roll call please. Councilmember Brooks? Aye. Councilmember Clark? Aye. Councilmember Peterson? Aye. And Mayor Kaiser? Aye. Passes unanimously. It will bring us to our general government. And 8A this evening is the state budget update from Senator John Laird. Welcome. Thank you very much. And uh, it's great to be here. And at one point, I was mayor of Santa Cruz, and if we had ever had an oral communications that brief, we would have thanked God, <laughs> <laughs> as it never happened. Um, 
he, he, I would like to make a, a brief update and some of which you know, and then if there are any questions, because I know this is a brief amount of time, but last year it w was the busiest year I had ever had in state government between Diablo Canyon and saving Watsonville Hospital and 20 bills and a climate package and education budget and a whole host of things. And I was so excited this year about being able to decide what I wanted to work on and then Mother Nature arrived. And, and so in January, in a 10-day period, I was at 10, uh, in those 10 days, I was at 22 sites in this district that were in essence disaster areas. And I was here with a number of you and the city manager uh, just days after the wharf and the restaurants and, and saw what you really needed. And I think we didn't think we were gonna get much in the budget this year because of sort of the deficit the state uh, shows. And some of us really advocated for our districts. And in my case, it was really trying to get things uh, for storm damage or where there were impacts from the storm. And I mean, there was a levy that was notched in San Luis Obispo when I got money there to, to help that. We had trouble in the Salinas River with flooding. The Carmel River went into homes and we got money to help plan for that. And in... Pajaro, we got money to continue to help the people that were evacuated at the fairgrounds. There was Westcliff and the things going on in Santa Cruz, but I think one of the biggest chunks was to the city of Capitola, and it was for two things. It was for uh, the Stockton Avenue Bridge, which took a hit, but is still structurally okay, and for the wharf. And, and I know you need whatever help you could get. And so it's a million dollars between those two things. And and uh, just, I was pleased to be able to do that in this. And one comment, and I wanna thank the mayor and the city manager, because this weekend we had some Senate staffers here and we met with them and went through a state of, of what is happening post storm. And I sort of talked about the fact that uh, you have some tough decisions here to make. And, and one of them is, is that I had the misfortune, uh, the mayor had the misfortune of getting elected, becoming mayor, and then having one of the biggest disasters in modern mm -hmm. capital history while she was just minding her own business and trying to, to do the job. And I was on the Santa Cruz City Council for six weeks when we had the 100-year storm. And that was the one where 75-foot redwood trees came down the river and battered down the SoCal Avenue Bridge. And so the city over 10 years, and, and the city manager gets as much credit as the council members or the mayor at the time, we redid all four bridges in Santa Cruz. We arched them. So in this storm, uh, that was really resilient. Nothing was going to happen. And yet, who didn't? Caltrans. And so the Highway 1 bridge, which is the first one on the San Lorenzo River when you hit town, in the first two atmospheric rivers, it was closed for two days while they had a crane remove all the debris, and then they couldn't keep up with it, and it flooded back uh, into places there. And I know you had trouble with Stockton. The Soquel, uh, uh, in Central Soquel Bridge, really went back, and the mobile home park was mudded out, and water was into businesses. And it's a really difficult thing because those bridges that are really flat or aren't arched are not necessarily climate resilient for these storms. And I think you're, the reason you're in a tough position is everybody in this town loves that bridge and they love it as a historic icon and they love it the way it is. But over time, it's going to be a problem and you're going to have a tough decision about what to do because it's going to be that iconic status versus the safety of it flooding back and, and catching things in atmospheric rivers that we may have more frequently. And so the state budget is such that the highway money, um, you would have to compete if you wanted to fix, for example, the, the Caltrans Bridge in Santa Cruz, you would have to compete against a highway widening or a road upgrade or other things in the current budget configuration. <laughs> So this year, as a result of the storms, Caltrans has separated out a billion dollars that will be for resiliency of infrastructure. And at a hearing, I said, that's really good. I appreciate that step, but we could use it all in my Senate district, and there's 40 Senate districts. And so appreciate the start, but there is really a need for it. And I think that's the thing we're going to want to work with over time. 
and I got a very good explanation from your city manager about the wharf and, and what needs to be done. And I think over time, I'll be happy to work with state agencies. Uh, if there's future things with the state budget, although if we keep having budget years like this one, we'll have to figure it out somehow. And uh, yet it was a pleasure to be able, in a tough budget year, to be able to help you. And I think we're going to now just have to work going forward to make sure that that we can do it on a broader basis and make sure that, that you actually got enough that you needed. And I know Jimmy Panetta's been really helpful and Don Addis has been involved and, and that's been good. So just wanted to report on that. And it's nice in a tough budget time to actually have some good news. And if there's any brief time, I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. And I appreciate the Capitola hat. I wasn't going to wear it uh, right now, but I'm glad to have it. Yeah, are there any questions? There is a gift for you, Senator. Okay, so we will go to item 8B, Children and Youth Bill of Rights. The recommended action tonight is to adopt a resolution adopting the City of Capitola Children and Youth Bill of Rights. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and City Council members. This evening, staff has brought for your consideration the City of Capitola Children and Youth Bill of Rights. As a reminder, during the budget goal setting workshop in May, the City Council directed staff to prepare a Children and Youth Bill of Rights. Staff researched and modeled this bill from similar initiatives from local jurisdictions and elsewhere around the state. Adoption of this resolution and bill will signal the City of Capitola's commitment to ensuring that the needs of our youth are always a top priority. For additional context, Capitola does currently offer several youth programs, including programs like Camp Capitola, the Junior Guards, and several after-school programs. The city also partners with the Youth Action Network in Santa Cruz County and provides around $60,000 in grant funding via the Early Childhood and Youth Community Grant Programs. Children and youth are often one of the most vulnerable groups in our community. Research sh shows that California ranks poorly and sometimes among the worst in the nation in categories like economic, educational, health, and overall well-being. In Santa Cruz County, 27% of children are food insecure, and 47% are eligible for free and reduced lunch programs. 43% of teens report using alcohol or drugs, and almost one-third of our kids have experienced depression. These issues are sobering from an emotional perspective, and they're costly too. In 2019, the country spent $408 billion on children's issues, which was almost 10% of the budget. And while the federal budget expands, youth supporting programs can be the first to fall behind. Over the next decade, all categories of youth spending, except health, are expected to decline relative to GDP. So staff recommends adoption of this bill of rights to formalize our commitment to the children in our community now and years into the future. So with that, staff recommends the City Council adopt a resolution adopting the City of Capitola Children and Youth Bill of Rights. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any uh, questions? No? Great. 
Okay. Any public comment on this item? Anything online? We don't currently have any speakers with their hands raised, Mayor. Great. This can go back to council deliberation or a motion. Um, so I am really excited about seeing this come forward today. Um, this is an extension of a countywide effort for every city and the county of Santa Cruz to adopt the Children's Bill of Rights. I mean, it began with the city of Santa Cruz, then the county followed in suit, and here we are with our city of Capitola um, being presented with it today. Um, this is also part of the initiative of the Children's Network, where Councilmember Clark is my co-chair or my, my uh, alternate on, and the Children's Network is um, a group of, of electeds and community members coming together to identify the, the, the needs of our youth in the community. And um, with that work came together 10 initiatives, 10 Youth Bill of Rights um, that we can focus on. So some of the work I've done, I actually had a meeting this afternoon right before here, um, was to prioritize and identify how we wanted to move forward with this because it could, it's one thing for it to be on paper and then it's another thing for it to actually be meaningful for our youth in our community. Um, so I'm happy to make a motion to adopt the Bill of Rights with the addition of adding um, uh, a $2,000 stipend for students who participate as our um, liaison. So Council Member Brown, who isn't here this after, uh, evening, uh, when she first came on board, she um, and asked, or we adopted, that there would be uh, youth representatives for all of our commissions. And um, it really hasn't really set off too well. And we're trying through the Children's Network to come up with creative ways to incentivize more youth participation. And so I'd like to invest some of our dollars um, so I'd like to make a motion to just add in a $2,000 stipend for any youth participation and more to come on the Children's Network of what that would look like. Um, and I'm looking over at Tamar, who is our attorney today, who might be whispering whether I can even, in fact, make this motion <laughs> because she's whispering pretty quickly here. <laughs> We'd need to uh, do a little bit of research to ensure that the way that we roll that out is legal um but we can come legal. back to yeah like legal's legal. good yeah. um but we can come back to the council with a proposal to to make that happen okay so then my motion i'll withdraw that motion and make a motion that we adopt tonight's um item with the uh with staff coming back with um, some sort of financial investment or incentive for more youth participants and i'd second that motion <clears throat> We have a first and a second. Maybe we have a roll call, please. Councilmember Brooks. Aye. Councilmember Clark. Aye. Councilmember Peterson. Aye. And Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Thank you. Passes unanimously. Take us to item 8C. Tonight we're talking about the Jade Street Park uh, Universal Playground Project. The recommended action tonight is to approve the final concept design for the Jade Street Park Universally Accessible Playground Project. We have Director Khan presenting. Well, good evening, Mayor Council members. Uh, we are pleased this evening to bring you the final conceptual design for the universally accessible playground at Jade Street Park. Next slide, please. Just a very brief background since we have talked about this several times, but this uh, playground is to replace an existing playground constructed in 1999 and somewhat revised in 2007 with an all-inclusive play area. Um, on the consent calendar tonight, you all approved an MOU with the Friends of County Parks for a fundraising campaign for this project. In uh, February, we executed an agreement with Verde Design to do the community outreach efforts and the uh, conceptual design of this project, which was presented to you all in uh, June, you uh, gave us some feedback, and we are back this evening with our final design for this project. So with that, I'm going to toss it over to Todd Young of Verde Design to go over the uh, elements of this final concept plan. Thank you. I'm Todd Young with Verde, and we're going to walk through some of the uh, changes and uh, amendments that we made to the plans since our last meeting in June. 
So we'll talk a little bit about the project uh, and the process that we went through to get here and also the concept plans, and then we have an enhancement plan as well. So the universal design is about accessibility, making more opportunities for the larger community within the, within the park, um, and also allowing for different levels of opportunities within the park. So we did our outreach where we listened to the community. We started with a listening exercises where we gathered information as to what the park should be and what the community felt like was appropriate for the spaces. Then we gave several options. We used surveys, pop-ups, and community meetings. We came together with uh, two different alternatives. We got feedback from the community on that and presented to the council in June a preferred alternative. And now today we're going to go with a draft final alternative. So here we are with the concept plan. In here you can see we've uh, simplified the entrance. We're maintaining the existing access points. but We are still creating an entry plaza. That entry plaza then leads to the main access way for the uh, playground where we split the spaces in the 5 to 12 on one side and the 2 to 5 play area on the other. And then it ends in a node where we have another gathering space and then connected to the other uh, access points around it. Uh, we've circled the uh, play areas with a nice group of trees. We're trying to get some shade into the play area and also create that edges and confinement so that the, the user group can really feel like they're in a, an enclosed space with a sense of place. <clears throat> this is not a very big difference from the other one. We did what we did was um, reduce some of the um, entry area. We reduced a little bit of the square footage of the play area itself. We consolidated and simplified some of the play equipment on this space, uh, but we tried to keep to the true nature that we uh, proposed the, the, at the previous meeting. Um, in this, we've got uh, a large swing um, operation on the uh, 5 to 12. We've also got spinners, rockers. We've got a composite play structure in the uh, 5 to 12 area, and then a ship play structure in the 2 to 5 area. Uh, we've got a slide mound where kids can walk up with uh, or roll up with a wheelchair or walk up the hill and then slide back down. So we've got an elevated area for the two to five play area. We also have uh, maintained some of the sensory things such as the, uh, the music nodes. We've also in, um, preserved the sensory garden uh, aspect of it. So you've got that as a, as a feature of the park at this uh, stage. Um, and then let me go to the next slide. We'll go into some of the details. So here's the arrival where we keep the entry. We have a monument sign. We have a picnic table there. And we also have some seating. So we have a, created that little entry node or arrival space. Then we maintain an iconic structure, with it, which is all accessible with ramps to, the, uh, to all the different decks and slides. Uh, and that's for the 5 to 12 play area. There's an image of what it might look like when we have this lighthouse style structure. And then here are the individual play features. There'll be a swing set with three different types of seating in it, belt swings, toddler swings, swings and also the support straddle. Uh, we've got the rocker element, which uh, accommodates several children at the same time in different mobilities. So you can stand on it or sit in it. We've got the roll on zero edge, uh, uh, inclusive whirl, and also another spinning element where all kids can use it in different fashions and um, without being able to differentiate what each ability is of each student or child, they get to play on the features evenly. And then the two to five has this strong concept of the ship where it's all ground activated so everyone can use it without uh, limitations as far as their abilities, whether they're wheeling or with, uh, with uh, walkers or uh, total able-bodied. Other features of the two to five are the cozy dome. We've got spring riders and then we've got that slide mound that I mentioned before where you've got multiple opportunities to be able to climb up it with either hand grips or holds or a gentle slope, but you can also slide down it with two slides. Here's an image of the different types of components, the spring rider, the cozy dome, the different slides, and also there's a uh, countertop in there as well at a children's style and size. 
The music has been preserved. We have a sort of like a marimba kind of a piece of equipment and also percussion. Um, and in that area, the South Plaza, we preserved a game table and also a family table. And then this brings us to the enhancement. So that is our base project, which fulfills all the needs for an accessible community. But if we wanted to use the same footprint and put a little bit more emphasis in it, if fundraising is available, I've highlighted the different items here, and I'll go through those different elements. But it's using the same footprint. We've just rearranged and, um, and economized some of the spaces in between a little bit better. <clears throat> So we've got the tot swing, a cyclone spinner, a Revy rock bouncer, another spinner, a roller slide for the two to five area, kinder bells for the music, and a five to 12 spinner as well added to it, as well as a group area that you can see in the south and south plaza. Uh, there's a group picnic area, which we had made into a landscape area in the more economical version. Uh, banner poles are things that capture the wind so you can see that, feel it. Um, it's great with sensory, so we had one in the base, but we have three in the enhanced version, um, and also additional game tables. Here's that equipment. So with the enhanced plan, we have uh, one more uh, um, toddler slide, or swing, I'm sorry, um, but we still have three bays, so it accommodates it in both plans. Other equipment is the cyclone spinner, which is a good feature it's a lot of energy and excitement on the playground. Uh, the bouncer, which is in the two to five play area. The kid four spinner, which is also in the two to five play area. And then we would add a roller slide to the two to five and take out one of those straight slides. And in the music zone, we would add the kinder bells. And for the five to 12, we'd add the, uh, the twist spinner. And all the plans will maintain the communication board those are the banner poles, these are the sensory items, and also those, uh, those musical items. The pollinator garden will remain in all of these versions with also the exterior um, walkway around the, the, the playground area so that the rest of the community can enjoy a walk and engage with nature as well. And the materials would remain to be concrete for all the hardscapes and the resilient rubber surfacing for the play areas. And we would have a fence that encloses the entire play area for the children and the parents and caregivers uh, to secure the space. Uh, materials for the basic, con uh, basic plan would um, repurpose the existing benches The tables would be new. And uh, for seating elements, they could either be made out of concrete or stone. And that's it. I'll take questions. Thank you. Question? Yeah, I just had a quick question about the last slide. Mm -hmm. um, is that showing all of the seating that is going to be available? Or is, or is this showing like possibilities of seating? We have in this version, we have the tables, the picnic tables. We have the game tables. Those are in all the plans. The only difference would be the, pig, the benches themselves, if we repurpose the old benches, or if we provide new one with the enhanced plan. And, and what about like the rocks and concrete structures? Are those included in the basic plan? We have one seat pad, whether it be concrete or rock. We, you know, it's still flexible at the conceptual level, uh, but we do have one of them in the uh, base plan. Okay, and the uh, advanced plan, or sorry, if we're enhanced as well. Enhanced plan um, is that going to include more seating? Yes, it includes more. The group picnic area is the biggest change between the two because there's no group picnic area. In the base plan, we have three picnic tables that are scattered around the site, one in the front where you enter, one at the seating node by the 5 to 12, and one at the south plaza. But if we do the enhanced plan and get the funding for it, we can do a group picnic area that would be a group of picnic tables in addition to the others. So much. Um, can you tell me about the interactions you had with other experts um, around the? I'm just. I think the last time you presented, uh, I suggested talking to like County Parks friends and some of the partners that we have, just because yeah. they know more about the play structures um, better than I do and, and the design. 
Did you have any conversation with them about the um, items that you presented? To them? We did have feedback from them, and those were included in here. One of them was that be previously we had the play structure, some of the area was accessible and one of the platforms wasn't. We removed that. There was some other climbing features that uh, were um, highly prized by the community, but in balancing out the needs of the universally accessible, we interchanged it with other options. And that's where the cyclone spinner comes in as well as an option uh, because it is all inclusive where before we had a climbing kind of wall uh, which was more limiting, so some some children would not have the ability to use that. So they were part of the um, the input that we received, and uh, it was related in this. Great, thank you. And then um, I was processing everything, and you went over the sensory board. You said you we did include that. Yes, that correct. Communication board is part of the project, base or enhanced. Okay, great, thank you. Excuse right. me, Mayor. There were a few more slides to this presentation. Ooh. I'm so sorry. Uh, no, it's quite all Please right. Please continue. <laughs> appropriate time to ask questions. Okay. About the, uh, I don't think we have any more questions. If you want to get back to what you were doing, that's quite Fine. all right. <laughs> so the less fun part <laughs> is the, uh, the cost estimate for this project. So the last time we brought this project to council, we went over the current allocations that we have for this project from last fiscal year, this fiscal year, and what we expect from the fundraising campaign. Uh, in addition to some of the feedback that we received from council, uh, another piece of feedback was to design a project within the allocation that we had. So we did reduce the uh, footprint of the project, um, and we still have a total estimated cost above our current allocation. Um, in balancing the requests from council and to get a functional playground, um, most of the, a lot of the cost, I would say about 50% of the cost of the project is in the site work. So that's the way you get the bulk of your reduction is reducing the scope of the, the size of the playground. And so we did do that to get closer to our I, the, what we have budgeted for this project, but to reduce it any more would make it very difficult to expand in the future to, to have our base and enhance plan. It would just make it too tight to put in any more structures in the future if we were to have more fundraising. So that is how we come up with our shortfall of $345,000. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the anticipated schedule this of this project, uh, assuming that the final design is approved this evening, we would start fundraising with the county park friends. That's expected to be 12 to 18 months in duration. And then at the end of that, we want to have a bid ready project. So when there, we've reached about 75% of um, the fundraising goal, we would come back to council for an amendment to our contract with Ready Design to do the plan specifications and estimate for a constructible project in hopes of starting construction in spring of 2025. Um, so along the way, we would give you future council updates regarding fundraising efforts, including seeking funding for that $345,000 funding gap, depending on how fundraising is going, and then the amendment that I mentioned to the Verde contract. And the recommendation this evening is to approve the final conceptual design, and both Todd and I are available for questions. Thank you. I'm for real this time. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> Do we have any other follow-up questions? Go ahead. I'm just curious, do we need to approve either the basic or the enhanced design at this time, or is that a decision we can make at a later date? That would be a decision for a later date, depending on fundraising. The goal would be to get to the base plan, and a, we get a huge funder, or you want to allocate more money to the project, then we can make the decision at when you're redoing the final design for the project. And what is the deadline for making that decision, I guess? Approximately. I think it's dependent on how successful and how quick the fundraising takes place. Uh, okay. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Any public comment on this item? Anybody here? Hi, I'm the community mobilization leader, Tony Fairfax. I just was my support in the Street Playground. Um, 
because if there's no other possibility that you know of, I mean, is that completely from Sumanella Island? Uh, so, there's a new thing made. Um, it was part of the ultimate call and everything. Uh, market was being built. So, I'm seeing that Yale Council has an awesome community. And, um, I really want to be made. So, um, uh, City Council to priority the Indian background. I think that supporting would provide for not only in the project, but also ensure that embrace diversity, inclusion, and the work of all the no matter the community. So, thank you so much. Great, thank you. Well, I want to thank you, Council and staff, for your vision in putting this project together and making sure that it moves forward. Um, Dan Hafley, I'm a, a volunteer with County Park Friends, and we're going to begin the fundraising campaign tomorrow. And uh, if you happen to be around today, there was a wonderful presentation on Off the Lip Radio with Council Member Brooks and uh, Tricia Wiltshire, who's the campaign manager. It was on Santa Cruz Waves. Uh, so if you go to that web page, uh, or if you go to that Facebook page, you can see it there uh, play. And then tomorrow, we'll start fundraising in earnest. Um, I think with the nature of uh, the conversations we've had with donors so far, it looks like we will be able to uh, achieve the $1 million goal. It'll probably, we won't get as many large gifts as we had anticipated originally, but there'll be uh, a strong grassroots campaign for smaller and medium-sized gifts. So I think we'll have some success there. So the uh, website, um, if you are interested in giving, is countyparkfriends.org. And then it's forward slash Jade Street Park. And that's not street spelled out, it's S-T, Jade Street Park. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me and we'll be back to you with periodic updates as we move forward. So thank you. Great, thank you. Hi. Hi. Thank you for uh, having us tonight. My name is Lisa Harvey Duran, and I'm a, a community member here. Um, I'm also part of the Capitola Aptos Rotary. And so I'll be helping with some of the fundraising for this project. Um, this project is really important to me uh, my daughter, Kayla, was born with a pretty severe disability at birth in 2005. She was uh, diagnosed right at birth with a form of muscular dystrophy called myotonic dystrophy. Um, we moved together to Capitola as she started kindergarten for better opportunities, more inclusive environment, great programs here. And so we lived right here up on Canmar. And, uh, you know, we really enjoyed it. Kayla loved this area. She was a... Um, student at SoCal Elementary, where at that point I kind of fought for her because I really felt like the classroom she was in was not a great setting. And so she, we moved her to a fully inclusive setting, and then she went and attended um, New Brighton Middle School. She really loved that too. She became a part of that community. The kids all got to know her, got to understand kind of what it's like to have differences. And, you know, they, they really... They accepted her as one of their peers. Um, they may not have always understood what was going on with her, you know, the, her physical limitations, but she really became a part of that classroom and she just loved school. So um, this universally accessible project is so important for kids like Kayla, for kid typically developing, you know, peers. It's so important for everybody to have one place to play. I've been to so many playgrounds with Kayla where she used a walker or a wheelchair or sometimes could walk a little bit. But you know, they're full of bark and things that were just completely impossible for her to navigate. And you know, broke my heart as a mom. So um, Kayla passed away at the end of eighth grade and tomorrow would be her 18th birthday. So I just wanna say, sorry. I'm really grateful for all of you for uh, looking at this project and how important it is for this community. I think it's long overdue for Capitola to have a park that includes all of us, including elderly. And, you know, it's not just for the kids. So thank you so much. And I uh, really appreciate your time. Thank you for your story. I appreciate it. 
there any members in the public? Seeing nobody else, is there anybody online? There are no members with their hands raised. Great, thank you. We can come back to council for any further deliberation, comments. Um, well, this is, this is exciting. We know this is good mm -hmm. stuff that we're doing here today. Um, just uh, to recap on our um, consent agenda, this that, to begin this agenda, on our consent agenda, <laughs> um, we actually approved the fundraising partnership with County Parks and Friends, which was the first step um, to moving this forward. And so I'm uh, thrilled that we have them as a partner because of the work and their dedication, um, not just to this project, but to Leo's Haven. This park is not just for our youth, our, our community members. This is for the entire county and and um, all of the surrounding areas. So uh, there's there there's not many. This would be number two, and I'm kind of looking over at this is number two in the entire county that we're. This is the um, for us. So it's 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 pretty significant. Um, I love the conceptual design. I think as we fundraise more than a million dollars, and I'm looking at all of our partners here today who will go online and fund and donate tomorrow when it goes live, please do. We need this. Um, Capitola needs this. Our county needs this. So I um, would like to make a motion to um, direct staff to prepare a final concept plan for consideration uh, for tonight's, um, I'm reading the wrong one because I'm too excited about this, uh, approve the final conceptual design for the Jade Street Park. A universally accessible playground project. I'll second that. Great. We have a first and a second. Um, I just want to say thank you uh, for everybody that has put work into this project. Um, as you can see, it's very important, and I'm excited to see what fundraising efforts we can get. I want to echo what uh, Councilwoman Brooks said about fundraising. Um, anybody that's out there, we welcome it. Um, this is our time to become more inclusionary and um, really spearhead these movements that hopefully will ripple out into other communities. Um, so with that, maybe please have a roll call. Councilmember Brooks. Aye. Councilmember Clark. Aye. Councilmember Peterson. Aye. And Mayor Kaiser. Aye. That passes unanimously. Thank you so much. So we'll drop down to 8D. We are on the community center renovation project. This is our budget update. So tonight the recommended action is to receive the update on the external funding sources for the community center renovation project and authorize the amendment and to the professional services agreement with Boone Lau Ratliff Architects in the amount of 374,000 for final design documents, bidding support, and construction administration for the community center renovation project. And we're back. Good evening again. <laughs> um, we are back early with update on the community center reservation, uh, renovation project. Next slide, please. Um, so just as a brief reminder, uh, the re uh, community center is under a long-term use agreement with the SoCal Union School District. As part of that updated agreement, there are infrastructure improvements that are to be completed within four years, at, uh, November 2026. And those are the improvements on the top half of your screen. And then the ancillary improvements on the bottom half of the screen are improvements that the city intends to complete as well that were a part of that agreement. Next slide, please. Um, so at the last council meeting um, with Boone, Boone Low Ratcliffe Architects, we uh, presented the proposed plans. Um, they include all of the ancillary and infrastructure uh, improvements, um, including the sound dividers between the walls and general upgrades to the uh, office staff and then the uh, single user restroom and upgrade to the kitchen. Next slide, please. Also included were improvements to the exterior of the community center, uh, new paint, new siding, new roof. Next slide, please. Also included were some upgraded outdoor spaces, which are not part of the uh, use agreement, but somewhat critical to the continued use of this as a updated community space. Next slide, please. 
Um, so with that, we also received a cost estimate. Um, as discussed, it was quite a bit over what the total projected costs were for this project uh, in the long-term use agreement. Um, that's mostly due to some of the electrical and HVAC upgrades, but also exterior upgrades that are required due to the condition of the building. Uh, during that June 8th meeting, the council instructed staff to research external funding opportunities to complete this project, to refine the cost estimate for the project, and to return to council in September with additional information. So it is July. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. We received a million dollars in the state budget uh, for this project through the Natural Resources Agency. So while that doesn't uh, close the gap of the full uh, uh, budget for this project, it does uh, significantly impact it. Um, also, staff has looked into other external funding sources, specifically the Community Development Block Grant and then the Statewide uh, Parks Revitalization Program, or Prop 68. Um, we received prior, prior to this meeting, but after publishing of the packet, that neither of these programs are going to have a call to project this year, which is very unfortunate. Um, both of those projects, though, do look like they will have calls to projects um, in 2024. And generally, grants like that, um, you need a shovel-ready project, so something that is fully designed and ready to be bid. And next slide, please. Um, so with that, we've been talking to our project architect and have divided this project into phases. So phase A being those improvements that are required by the long-term use agreement to be completed within the four years, and phase B to be those ancillary improvements. There are a few improvements in phase A that are ancillary improvements, but that are so affected by the infrastructure improvements that it doesn't really make sense to do them in phase B. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so here is our uh, budget for fun different funding scenarios. So currently we have enough budget with the million dollars from the state budget to complete phase A. So all of those required infrastructure improvements. Phase A and B has a funding gap of about $2.7 million. Um, the final design cost there, the $374,000, is the amendment that you are considering this evening. This is a bit more than anticipated at the onsite of this project um, for several reasons. One is the phasing of this project. Two is the scope of this project has increased because of additional improvements that need to be done. And then also this um, project now requires the approval of the division of state architect, which is typically just for school sites. But since we're getting money from state parks, it's also required for all state parks projects. So it's another round of review that wasn't anticipated for this project. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so with that, the recommended direction or action is to authorize the amendment for the professional service agreement with Boone Low Ratliff Architects. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Any questions, Council? Mm -hmm. um, Jessica, do you need Council's um, direction to still seek additional funding sources for any other shovel-ready projects? So, it, like the CDBG grant funding, and like for us to move forward to still try to access those funds in addition to this project. Staff still intends on it when they have the call to projects to do those. I will say that this project ideally is constructed in the fall. Um, so that would push us into, an, in, into another year. So that would give us a whole year to continue to seek funds. Um, just because fall, there's less activity at the community center. Okay. And then my second question in regards to the design with Boone, Low Ratcliffe Architects. Um, are they, is this going to come back for us to look at more design elements to kind of coincide with the park, you know, because they're doing some sort of, will it be matchy and pretty? Yes. So the outdoor spaces would be revised on the side that is facing the park to make sure that those do go together. So yes, we would bring that back to council for all of the outdoor, yes, with the final design. Okay, thanks. Great, any other questions? All right, we can go to public comment on this item. Anybody in the house or online? There are no speakers with their hands raised. Okay, we can bring this back to council. Any further comments or deliberation? I, 
guess all I would point out is, is that we're going to have a challenge here for us. You know, unfortunately, we found out this week that CDBG was not going to open up this year. Um, we had been hopeful that we could put in a major ask in CDBG to try to fund to close this gap. So the good news is that we, you know, we have a phase A that's really close to in budget at this stage and would get us what we need to get done in the lease. Uh, but we're going to have to all kind of put our, keep our thinking caps on and look for the funds under every uh, under every rock that we can to try to figure out how to get to that fully funded project because it's an important facility and I think at the end of the day just doing the bare bones to it, it wouldn't be very much that the community would feel like all of the stuff that the community would feel is in those that later phase uh, and so I think. You know, it's going to be a challenge, but I think we can do it. It's just going to have to be uh, some tough decisions, and, you know, we have to keep our eye out for those grants. And is there any, there's no, like, fundraising opportunities, or, like, that would that would require, obviously, a group to start that? It, it might. Um, it might, and there might be some even without a group, potentially. Um, you know, that is that is a rock that I'm looking under as well. Okay. Um, you know, at this point, we do have two major campaigns going in this community. So initiating a third major campaign, yeah, I would I recommend understand. against yeah. doing that at this stage. Um, but, you know, there, there may be an individual donor out there who's interested in kind of being a benefactor for the city and, you know, getting their name on the community center. So right. those are certainly opportunities that we're exploring. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, does this, I'm just thinking about our partnership with SoCal. Um, does this coincide with the timeline that we initiate or initially agreed upon with the school district for completion? So at this time, we still have a really good buffer before that four years is up that we were supposed to have the infrastructure. There will come a point that we will need to start the project to meet that, but we are not close to that at this time. And then um, because of the additional funding coming in for our wharf for the playground, and even for this, partic this particular project, at mid-year budget, will you be presenting to us, and I'm just being facetious here, um, really, but I'm guessing you'll bring this back to council for a mid-year budget so we can decide how to allocate any dollars we have um, or need to move around. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. We're gonna be talking about the wharf here shortly. Wharf, I think by the time we get to the mid-year project, will be a well well enough developed project that we'll know how much of the contingency might be left in that. Uh, and that will give us the opportunity to look at potentially reallocating some of the money. Great. Thank you. Would anybody like to make a motion? I can do that. <laughs> I will move to... Um, authorize Amendment 1 to the Professional Services Agreement with Boone Lowe Ratliff Architects in the amount of $374,000 for final design documents, building, bidding support, and construction and administration for the Community Center Renovation Project. Is that right? Okay. I'll second that. Great. First and a second. And may we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Brooks? Aye. Councilmember Clark? Aye. Councilmember Peterson? Aye. And Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Thank you. Passes unanimously. We will go to item 8E. This is our much anticipated Capitola Wharf Enhancement Project preliminary conceptual design item. The recommended action is to direct staff to prepare a final concept of design for the consideration of the City Council at the August 24th meeting for the Capitola Wharf Enhancement Project, also known as CWIP. And you get to still be here. Yes. Um, good evening again. Um, this is a uh, progress report on this project. Uh, as you mentioned, at the next meeting, we'll be bringing a preliminary cost estimate and uh, incorporating any feedback we may receive from the council tonight. These plans that were in your packet and also included in this presentation are public. Uh, they were displayed at the Wharf to Wharf this last Sunday at the, um, the volunteer group's booth at, in the Esplanade. And with that slide, thank you. So the Capitola Wharf Enhancement Project 
um, is a group of community members. It is enhancements to our current resiliency project that is fully budgeted and has a contract signed and is going, getting ready to get started in the next month or so. Um, it is for new and upgraded amenities to the Capitola Wharf, and they had set an initial fundraising goal of $250,000. In May, the uh, city went under contract with our RM Design Group to do a preliminary concept plan and some public outreach for this project. And in June 2023, Council approved an agreement with the Wharf to Wharf Race to be the administrator of the donations for this project. Um, so on June 7th, 2023, a community meeting was held at New Brighton Middle School. It was very well attended. Um, there was approximately about 50 people. There's also a um, survey put out by the uh, CWEP community group who that received hundreds of uh, responses, which is really very impressive for this type of project. Um, through a small group uh, brainstorming exercise, feedback was gotten back from the community. Um, the overall was that people really liked uh, the feel and theme of the wharf as it is, uh, that there's opportunity for more color, and they really don't like anything that reads SoCal at all. Uh, next slide, please. What, what was that last? Oh, Southern California. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, right. Yes, very strong preference for not Southern California. Okay. <laughs> um, so this is the concept board that came out of this community meeting. In the next slides, I will have some zoomed in images of this that I will describe to you. So this is our current entranceway. We have our iconic Capitola Wharf, but then we also have a bunch of stuff in front of the wharf um, from different uh, councils, different times the wharfs are renovated, different funders. Um, uh, recreational signage, warning signage. Um, and so this is really an opportunity to clean this area up. Next slide, please. So with that, um, that number one and number 11 are this cleanup. It's to consolidate all the required signage um, onto a uh, board and then to refurbish the um, Capitola archway with something that is still like the iconic arch, but a little more artful. Other improvements to the entranceway include pavers to kind of give an entrance and then a medallion on the pavers, which is a public art opportunity. Um, and then also in this picture, you can see the little fish. And so these are tiny little fish that are throughout the wharf that lead you to some of the educational panels and other items on the wharf. All of those are also public art opportunities where we could contract with a local artist to really get the final design of those elements. Uh, next slide, please. So this is also a uh, rendering of this. So you can see how the arch is still there. It looks very much like the iconic arch, but kind of has tiling underneath to bring more color. Um, so very lovely. Next slide, please. Um, other general amenities would be updated lighting and seating. Uh, no intense intensity of use uh, increase there, just uh, kind of like for like swap, just nicer looking amenities. Um, opportunities for educational signage, um, for things like binoculars, and then also places for art, specifically art for those who have donated to this effort. Uh, next slide, please. Um, also, then at the end of the wharf, there is an opportunity for shade. There is no shade at the wharf right now. <laughs> um, so shade structure, people tend to hang out at the end of the wharf, so that was, it was envisioned there and then also an updated uh, fish cleaning station. And then something that is outside the scope of probably this fundraising effort, but something that had a really strong preference and all of the feedback received, received from the community was the ability to have a shower at the head of the wharf uh, for beachgoers that are in more of that area of the beach over there by Hooper's Beach to be able to rinse off and go on to the wharf or go on into their day into the esplanade. So this is in the concept plan, but not really anticipated to be executed with this fundraising campaign. Next slide, please. And then one add-on that staff had to this concept plan was to do something about the entrance to the wharf. So right now it kind of looks like a private driveway. Um, this is not the most updated picture. There are some trees there that are now gone that will be replanted with this vision. Um, but there's definitely opportunities here for enhancements to tie it into the uh, overall look of the wharf, perhaps columns that look the same as the arch columns or some kind of monument sign that really show, here's our wharf, this is the vibe, turn here. Next slide, please. 
Um, so with that, um, the recommendation is have staff prepare a final concept plan for consideration by council in uh, August 24th. We would come back with a cost estimate. And I believe there are also members of the CWEP team here as well. Um, you may have public comment. I am happy to answer anything or any questions on this one. Great. We can start with council questions. Public comment. Come on down. It's helpful. Yo, yo, okay, here we go. I was a little bit confused with the picture that shows the area between the bathroom and the street. It's in green. Can you go back a few slides? Mm -hmm. I think, is that it? One more, I think. Right oh, back one forward again right there bottom bottom left hand corner is that to grade or is that down at beach level in other words that little area where the public art display is we can address yeah so this is a conceptual design, not an engineered design. So that would have to be determined. Um, likely not. It would probably not be degraded because it would wash out with heavy storms. Um, but that is not some. This is a concept, so it has not been designed. So it's just a nice picture. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Any other public comment? Uh, good evening, uh, Jerry Jensen with the CWEP uh, fundraising group. Uh, I just wanted to um, just publicly thank Jamie and Jessica and uh, Chloe who have been actively involved in um, the whole process of pulling this together and working with r &M. Um, It's been great. I'd also like to publicly thank uh, Wharf to Wharf and especially Scott McConville who was instrumental in working with us with the Wharf to Wharf last weekend and ongoing their um, commitment to helping us out. Uh, do fundraising. And so um, that was really it, but I just wanted to, again, thank staff for all their help and everything. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak or anybody online? Uh, good evening. I'm Skip Allen, a professional uh, Mariner and us, uh, Taylor. I'm a little confused about what enhanced um, lighting uh, means. And I am strongly opposed to increased uh, lighting on the wharf. It will hinder a uh, night uh, vision. It will confuse bird um, a migration, and I do not see the purpose of increased lighting. Now, if it's light for light, I would remind that there is currently uh, fixtures out there that have been in place for a long time, and they do provide the necessary safety. All I'm asking is that as the uh, proposal uh, moves forward, that the uh, uh, city council and public works keep in mind the uh, capital uh, codes, which speak to um, outdoor uh, lighting and the uh, preservation of uh, n n night skies on the wharf, and there shall not be glare on the beach uh, from the wharf. Um, so I'm all for 
um, updating the fixtures, but I really am opposed to increased or colored lighting or blinking lighting or anything that is going to possibly have unintended effects on birds and other uh, uh, sea life uh, when being watched on the wharf. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else in house? Or anybody online? There are no speakers with their hands raised. Great. I can bring this back to council. Any other comments? Um, first, can we have staff maybe address or see what address the enhancement, is it the definition of enhancement or define? In, in regards to the lighting? Yeah. So it was to replace the fixtures. So, and I definitely would keep in mind the type of bulb that's in there because I'm sure it won't be the same type of bulb that is in the current fixture for that to not have any intensity of use. But yes, by enhanced, we mean enhanced fixture, not more. And we will remain up to code. And yeah. The other response that I might offer to one of the comments issued about the shower is, is that while the final elevation of the shower, if we're even gonna do it, hasn't been identified, you know, I would just remind everybody that, you know, the, the, the Venetians, for example, are many feet below the elevation of the wharf. So there's a fair amount of elevation there that could be, uh, we could experiment with if we were examining that opportunity on the road. Um, so my additional comments is first, thank you. Thank you so much for putting this group together. Um, it definitely is, um, it, it helps all of us too in the design element. One of the things I shared with council at our last meeting is that I was working with the NOAA's Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary Foundation, uh, Sanctuary uh, staff on looking for potential funds to support the educational component of your the conceptual design, design presented today. Um, what I'd like to see at, an, as an add-on to this project is a kiosk where some of those educational design components could be added. Um, where I think I'm, I obviously I don't have the map of the of the wharf and the R PMs RPM is that the name of RM RRM RPMs are cars isn't it RMM could help us with maybe some design um, or some design elements I know that even some kiosks can act as storage um, and that could maybe benefit us, us and our our, our staff. Um, so I'd like to see that be built in, and um, if CWIP is inclined to working with the NOAA folks, I can also help connect the two of you. Um, they they've offered funding and supporting the signage on a part of this as part of this project. Great. I'd like to add to, add to the comment. Um, there are people that are still coming to me today that are interested in wanting to do things for the wharf. So I'd like to see as continue as before we get to the final final. Um, and keeping our open minds and see what we can bring working with CWEB in the city because um, there's several people out there that I don't think have been heard yet. So if we can continue um, moving forward and with all these great ideas, we can keep that in mind. Great. Anyone else? Yeah, I just um, I want to say I'm excited about this project. I do like sort of that the little fish scavenger hunt. I think that's a great idea. The binoculars, for sure. Um, and yeah, any any public art, any local artists that we can get involved, I think would really also enhance this project. Um, all right. So do we have a motion on the table? Yeah, I'd like to um, direct staff to prepare a final concept plan um, for the Capital Wharf Enhancement project, including a kiosk location um, and design uh, created by RMM. Yeah. I was just confused about the kiosk part of it. Yeah, so right now in the design that was presented, there isn't a kiosk, and so I would like um, RMM to include it, include one. 
Yeah, I agree with that because there are several ideas that, like I said, people are still coming to us now that we probably need to incorporate. But yeah, as we move forward, if we just keep our minds open and hopefully we get the funding and we can get a lot of good things. And on that, I'd like to second the motion. Uh, as a point of clarification, are you amending Councilmember Brooks's motion? No, oh, I was just adding to it. Okay, so you are. No, I was just adding my comment to it. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Reiterating. Okay, great. <laughs> so the motion is to. The only addition here is the kiosk. Right. Okay. Great. Motion and a second. We can have a roll call. Councilmember Brooks. Aye. Councilmember Clark. Aye. Councilmember Peterson. Aye. And Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Passes unanimously. Thank you, everybody. That will take us to 8F, the Capitol Road Pavement Rehabilitation Project. So our recommended action tonight is to approve the plans, specifications, and construction budget of, yes, I'm reading the right one, uh, 1.7 for the Capitol Road Pavement Rehabilitation Program, adopt a resolution amending the budget, and authorize the Department of Public Works to advertise for construction bids. I'll hand it back over to Ms. Khan. Last one. Good evening. Uh, next slide, please. So the Capitol Road Pavement Rehabilitation Project goes from the city limits of 30th Avenue to 40 through the 41st Avenue intersection. Uh, as you know, Capitola Road is a principal arterial roadway in the city with poor pavement condition. Uh, the PMP that the council approved in 2022 and the fiscal year 23-24 budget includes the rehabilitation of the section of roadway in 2023. Uh, staff has received, or the city has received a grant of $227,000 from the RTC. Um, and this money is specifically to rehabilitate the 41st Capitola Road intersection. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so there were several improvements included in this project, uh, the major one being the pavement improvement. Um, this is significantly more than anticipated when this project was budgeted. Um, we anticipated a two-inch mill and fill, and it's a four-inch mill and fill. So that is grinding double the amount of pavement off of the street and putting double the amount of asphalt back into the street. So that increases the cost uh, quite a bit, but this road is in pretty poor shape and it is an arterial roadway. So we want it to last for at least 15 to 20 years after these improvements. Uh, next slide, please. Other improvements include pedestrian improvements using thermoplastic striping for all crossings. Thermoplastic lasts a lot longer than paint for striping and then updating a lot of the ADA curb ramps. Uh, not included in this particular uh, bid package for approval this evening are upgrades to some of the push buttons, particularly at the uh, Claire's and 41st intersections and a tree removal near the Claire's intersections. Um, this contract is for the roadway. Um, those other elements of the project will be completed, but under different electrical and tree removal um, contracts. Next slide, please. Um, and then bicycle improvements. Um, so this is looking at 30th Avenue. Um, the striping is very bare there uh, right now, just worn over the years. So it would include green thermoplastic striping to show the transition of the bike lane uh, to go through that intersection. Then also white striping just to get people into the turn lanes. Uh, next slide. Uh, the major improvement to bicycle, um, bicycle issues will be at the 41st Avenue intersection. So to that end, a striping alternatives analysis for the improvement of the function and safety of that intersection for bicycles and vehicles was completed by Kim Lee Horn over the past few months. Um, there really are limited options to improving this uh, due to the intersection geometry and just the real estate we have at the 41st and Capitola Road intersection. And many of the alternatives resulted in it, um, more congestion or de decreased level of service or really no improvement to bicycle safety. So we took all of those alternatives to the RTC Bicycle Advisory Committee, who is a really, we are required to go to because of the funding, but also just a really great group of bicycle users to help us uh, identify a preferred alternative. Next slide, please. So the two real improvements that we could make to this intersection for bicyclists are cross bike intersections and bike boxes. You're probably more familiar with bike boxes. There's a few of those around the county. Uh, the issue with bike boxes is that really you have to restrict right turns on red. 
Um, as you can see from the example there on the right, like if someone, you can't really turn right there without potentially hitting the bicyclist. So there's no right turn on red, which increases congestion in the intersection. Uh, the other design alternative are cross bike intersections, which really show motorists and bicycles where uh, bicycles will be going through intersections, but then that really doesn't provide any benefit to a bicyclist turning left. Uh, so both have pluses and minuses, and next slide. So what we turned up with was kind of a hybrid of both. So this slide, there is a blow up on the next slide, is just to kind of get you oriented. The uh, top right corner there is the Whole Foods parking lot. And so up and down is 41st and left to right is uh, Capitola Road. Uh, next slide. Um, so zooming in, we have our cross spike markings and then going on Capitola Road um, east and west, <laughs> have our bicycle improvements with the bike boxes. So going eastbound towards like our community center, or sorry, westbound towards the community center, there's enough room there to separate out the lanes. So right now there are three lanes. There is a left, a left through, and a right through. This would separate out that right through to a through lane and a right lane. Um, so you're able to have the bike box and then a right lane that doesn't need a no right on red because it is a dedicated right turn lane. Going eastbound, we don't have that kind of real estate to separate out the lanes there. So out of this project, there would be one no right turn on red in this intersection. So going from the Whole Foods towards the mall on Capitola Road, I will say that is really tight as it currently is, and it's very hard to make a right turn on red if anyone is in front of you in the intersection. Basically not really feasible, so that's not a huge um, change in use and isn't, uh, doesn't really register on the increasing congestion in the intersection. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the fiscal impact of this, um, there's the transportation grant. We had budgeted in uh, this year's budget uh, Measure D and SB1 money for this project. Uh, as mentioned earlier, the rehabilitation of this project is significantly more than we had estimated at the onset. Uh, fortunately, there's also budgeted in fiscal year 23-24 general pavement maintenance in the CIP budget. Um, it is proposed here that we move all of that money to fund this project. This project is estimated at $1.7 million. Um, that money was intended to uh, move up some of the streets in our pavement maintenance program for next year into this year. Um, so that would not be happening with this project. However, it doesn't. It would keep us on track of the original goal of having those streets that we had identified for fiscal year 24-25 in 24-25 with the Measure D and SB1 money that we'd be getting in that fiscal year, if that makes sense. Next slide, please. Uh, so the recommendation here would be to approve the PSE for this project, advertise for construction bids, and to adopt a budget resolution. And I am available for any questions. Thank you. Any questions from council? Yeah, thanks. Um, if we could go to, I believe it's slide number eight with the um, bike intersection. I just want to make sure I understand. So is it, there's the green painted line or the, like the internal square? Hmm. Green, that's physically going to be there. Right? Is that right? Right. With thermoplastic, yes. Thermoplastic, okay. And that's a designated bike box to go through. Right. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, thanks. That, that was my only question. Oh, actually, sorry. I have another unrelated question. Um. A question about the um, let's see the electrical and tree removal contracts, and if we have a timeline for that. As um, we got an email saying that that was alerted to us that there were um, it, like ADA issues in April, and I just wanted to check the status on those improvements. Sure. So the tree would be removed by an arborist prior to the construction of the project because you need the tree to remove so then you can grind out the roots that remain. Um, the push buttons would happen afterwards. So the way the geometry is of the um, intersections right now, all of those ADA ramps are going to be replaced. So you want to replace the ramps first and then reset the push buttons. Um, it's anticipated with that one that we just add push buttons, leave the ones that are inside the pole, the signal poles would remain, and then we'd run an electrical line to have just a standalone push button for those intersections that are hard to access. 
And do we have a timeline for that? That would be immediately after the project is the hardscapes are completed. And sorry, I just want to remind to try to um, limit our comments to what's on the agenda today. But if you are interested in that update, then perhaps we can invite staff to come back with uh, more detailed information on the electrical, since I don't believe that's a part of this project. Um, I think I'm satisfied with that. Another question? I'm done. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, the square box picture, can you bring that back up? I'm just curious why... We're going really fast on north and south and sure. trying to catch up with it in my brain. But I think I'm there. I'm just curious why the bike box on the left bottom, this bigger one, hmm. isn't in alignment with the bike lane that's to its right. You see, so the so they could just turn right and they have to be like go around. You do see? I wish I could point to it. Up higher. Up higher, right there. The cap road yeah, eastbound direction. So they would go in that bike lane straight and then go around the sidewalk there. It just seems larger than where it aligns. Yeah, exactly where your little thing goes. Just how does that work? Oh, I see. I do see what you're saying. So I guess, yes, that would the bicyclists would have to shift right. They would wait in the bike box on the right side of the bike box, but then to yeah. get into that green lane to cross the intersection, yeah. right, that would be a shift to the right. And does that impede on the sidewalk at all? And pedestrian, you know what I mean? Like it gets pretty close. The bike does have to go far right. I mean, there's gotta be a reason they push it that far out. Is it just to utilize? You're looking at the exact thing I'm like. Yes, no, I, I see what you're saying. And that can definitely be, Revised. I, I assume it's at the standard, but that is something we can look at closer. Yeah, I'm just curious why they would push it out so far. I think there's an opportunity there to exit. So the black striping there for the pedestrians is yeah. in white, but it's for the purposes of visualization, it's in black. That could be longer and then push the bike lane further into the intersection, the green crossing. Yeah, because then they're going into the pedestrian lane right, right away. Mm-hmm. I'll let you process if that even is needed to do. <laughs> I was just curious. Thank you. And then the no right on red, is that is that going to be at all hours of the day? Yes. Okay. okay. That no right on red is probably the largest sort of change motorists would notice right. with this intersection. And what we're talking about is if you're driving down Cap Road towards... Yeah, going towards Santa Cruz before you get, you know, you've just gone past Whole Foods and uh, Wells Fargo's on your right. In general, I feel like if there's one, maybe two cars is all you can squeeze by. So would we start that before the project in order to get people, like, up to speed or we're just going to do it all at once? I just know up at Claire's it's, like, it's still an issue. Like, people still don't obey that or notice that it's there, so... I mean, anytime you shift lanes or make some kind of intersection change, it's going to take people time. I would say if it became an issue, we could do some enforcement up there for the no, especially on the no right turn on red. Um, okay, cool. Thank you. I think we can go to public if anybody in house wishes to speak. Come on up. prepared my comments before hearing about the push buttons, but it's a little confusing whether the entire budget is going to go to paving or and, and the electrical will just happen at some point. So if it's okay, I'd like to read my comments entirely. Um, happy 33rd anniversary to the ADA, Americans with um, uh, Disabilities Act. The official anniversary was yesterday, but I'm still celebrating. My name is Marianne Ahern. I work in Capitola. My friends who work in Cap who live in Capitola are not able to be here because they have to be home to meet their caregivers who have set schedules. 
but I'm representing their comments to you about traveling in mobility devices on Capitola Road between 30th and 41st Avenues. Karen, Pam, Stephanie, Ryan, Deborah, and Jonathan want you to know that there are difficulties with crossing Capitola Road that I don't see addressed on the paving improvement plan on the website, um, but maybe it's available elsewhere. I haven't researched entirely. On our, on our part, months ago, we've submitted uh, hazard reports to the SEC, RTC, and Capitola Public Works about the following points. First, my friends are very, very grateful for your plans to pave part of Capitola Road. On her way across Capitola Road at Clare Street to go shopping, Karen has had to go out of the crosswalk so that her wheelchair does not get stuck in the potholes that are in the middle of the crosswalk. She appreciates the paving part of the plan. Second, the signal buttons or APS are difficult to reach on Capitol Road, Capitola Road and nearby. And I am thinking that the paving and the curbs and everything might change. So to do them, the electricity in conjunction makes sense to me, but I'm nobody. <laughs> to reach uh, some of them from their chairs, either their feet hang out over the curb uh, and into the street because they have to get close to the button, or if they have the mobility, they have to turn their chairs at an angle. So I hope that's considered with these new curbs. Um, Karen's feet hang out over the curb, putting her at risk for being hit by right turn drivers. I have pictures of that if anyone's interested. Third, the old signal buttons at some locations may require more than five pounds of pressure to push. Okay, so I will just say that Stephanie really values the walk, uh, audible walk signals, because she has to watch for cars and look at that. And I think it's a mistake, unless you have already, it sounds like you probably have, but to approve a paving plan without first reviewing the ADA Title II that requires improving accessibility when work is performed at a location. We noticed on 41st Avenue, at least one recommendation was not, not followed. And we hope this isn't repeated on Capitola Road. Thank you very much for your care. Thank you very much. Do we have anybody else in house that wishes to speak? Or anybody online? We don't have anybody with their hands raised, Mayor. Great. Great. We can come back to council. Any further comments or questions? I, I guess it's a follow-up question that maybe we can bring back later. It's interesting to, to think about the, the buttons, right, on the, and I don't know if it's part, if it correlates or if it doesn't, but perhaps we can get some information on like our updates um, on what our best practices are, what we have throughout the city for um, pedestrian crosswalk buttons and things like that, kind of how it aligns with ADA. Uh, no, I don't, I think it would be nice for all of us to have it later. I don't think it's relevant now to me. You can hear me. <laughs> so with that, um, I'm happy to make a motion to pass Staff recommendation, my internet is loading right here, and I know you don't like staff recommendations, so I'm trying to load it as fast as possible. Thank you. Do you want to? One more thing. Oh, do you, I'm sorry, do you have something? I just wanted to add to, to what you said, if we're bringing it back to talk about ADA issues, um, the person's comment about not following their ADA recommendation on a, another project, that if you could just address that back. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to make a motion to approve the plan specifications and construction budget of $1.7 million for the Capitola Road Pavement Rehabilitation Project. Adopt a resolution. Joe, your head's in the way. Amending the fiscal year 23-24 budget and authorize the Department of Public Works to advertise for construction bids. Thank you. I'll move my head and I'll second it. <laughs> Multitasking. <laughs> Wonderful. We have a first and a second. May we have a roll call? Councilmember Brooks? Aye. Councilmember Clark? Aye. Councilmember Peterson? Aye. And Mayor Kaiser? 
Okay, that passes unanimously. It'll take us to item 8G, City Council appointments to advisory bodies. The recommended action is to appoint members of the public to the City of Capitola Arts and Cultural Commission and the Historical Museum Board. Thank you, Mayor. And with that, I'd like to relieve Jessica. <laughs> that was a long run. run. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Tonight, for your consideration, we have two appointments for unscheduled vacancies on the Art and Cultural Commission and the Historical Museum Board. Government Code 54974 governs the vacancy notice process for unscheduled vacancies. And as a reminder, an unscheduled vacancy occurs when a member leaves their term early versus the regular appointment process. For these two vacancies, we published a notice in the newspaper as well as several social media and online postings. Um, we received a total of five applications for the two vacancies. And the city clerk's office is currently recruiting for an additional vacancy on the Art and Cultural Commission that will be processed separately. For the Art and Cultural Commission, we received four applicants. This unscheduled vacancy is for a term expiring December 31st of 2024. The applicants were reviewed in accordance with the commission bylaws and the applicants um, had to attend a meeting for the commission and the commission makes a recommendation. The Historical Museum Board has an unscheduled vacancy for a term expiring June 30th of 2024 and they received one application which was reviewed in accordance with their board bylaws. The Art and Cultural Commission recommends appointment of Jennifer Major. Um, this is the, one of the four applicants that was received and reviewed. And for the Historical Museum Board, they recommend appointment of Brian Legakis. Excuse me if I pronounce that incorrectly. And so the recommended action this evening would be to appoint one member of the public to the Art and Cultural Commission for a term expiring December 31st of 2024, and one member of the public to the Historical Museum Board for a term expiring June 30th of 2024. And for your convenience, I'll just put the names back up of the applicants that we received. I'm available for any questions if you have them. Anybody wish to speak from the public? Seeing none. Anybody online? We don't have any speakers with their hands raised, Mayor. Thank you. Okay, we'll come back to council. Do we have any comments or motions? I guess, is there a way for the um, people who applied who were not selected to be involved? Are there any opportunities of like a non-voting membership or something along those lines? I, I'm on the Art and Cultural Commission, so maybe I can answer that. <laughs> there, there are plans. Um, there's probably another vacancy coming up, and we would like to get them all on board eventually. So, yeah, there's definitely plans. Great. Thank you. So just another point. Um, applications remain on file with the city for a one-year period. Um, so if anyone who didn't get appointed in this cycle, as I mentioned, there's another upcoming vacancy that we're currently recruiting for and that will be brought before council um, once the recruitment period ends. And so there will be another opportunity for um, a member of the public to be appointed. Um, they can also apply to join other commissions. We notify them of the appointment process after the council makes a decision and they're welcome to apply to other groups if there are vacancies. And then these meetings are Brown Act meetings, so members of the public can always attend a meeting and comment because the meetings are open to the public. Thank you. All right. Would we like to make a motion? I'll move to make a motion. Uh, first, that we appoint the Art and Commission, Art and Cultural Commission's uh, choice. Jennifer Major. And then the History Museum Board, the, their applicant, Brian Lagakis. I'll second that. Great. We can do them together. Okay, yeah. Thanks. All right. May we have a roll call, please? Sure. Councilmember Brooks? Aye. Councilmember Clark? Aye. Councilmember Peterson? Aye. And Mayor Kaiser? Aye. Great. Passes unanimously. So that'll take us to our last item, which is nine, which is the adjournment. Thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening.
Um, we, again, have a little hiatus, so we won't be back until August 24th here in Chambers. So we'll see you then. Thank you, everybody, for the support and volunteer work and lots of great things going on in the city. So hats off. All right. Good evening. Woo.